And before I introduce our speaker, just remember to hold the button down on your microphone when you ask questions. And with no further ado, I would like to welcome and invite Bob Hadlow from the Oregon Department of Transportation. And he's going to be speaking to us today on the Columbia River Highway. And we're really looking forward to his presentation. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bertini. Thank you to PSU. The topic today is the Columbia River Highway, America's first scenic highway. In 1917, a Sunset Magazine correspondent wrote that he had seen Niagara Falls, the Grand Canyon, Pikes Peak, and Yellowstone Park, which he marveled at and became awestruck. But after driving the Columbia River Highway through the Columbia River Gorge, he believed that the route was a grand achievement in the science of modern road building, nothing short of a national asset. In 1920, the periodical excavating engineer believed that the Columbia River Highway stands today as undoubtedly the greatest monument to road building industry in the West. That most modern of roads was Walter Winston Crosby's estimation of the route in his 1928 textbook entitled Highway Location and Surveying. Harriet Salt stated in her 1937 volume entitled Mighty Engineering Feats clear and concise descriptions of ten of the greatest American engineering feats, that the Columbia River Highway was one of the world's greatest examples of highway engineering. John Yon, a successful Pacific Northwest lumberman and later roadmaster of the Columbia River Highway's construction, simply saw this road as the greatest single asset not only in Oregon, but in the West. And Philip Townsend Hanna, editor of the Los Angeles-based Western Highways Builder, a trade publication at the time, wrote that the hardy and honest people of Oregon have built the greatest highway in the world, no matter from what angle you consider it, as a transportation artery, as a scenic boulevard, or as an engineering feat. Now, Jan considered Hanno's comments very significant because, quote, the people of California are loath to concede superiority in road matters to any place. In 1919, National Park Service Director Stephen Mather marveled at the road's sensitivity to the landscape. John Arthur Elliott, designer of the, of the Mitchell Point Tunnel, however, most elegantly summed up the entire rationale for the route's alignment and construction. He wrote, the ideals sought for the Columbia River Highway were not the usual economic features and considerations given the location of a trunk highway, grades, curvature, distance, and even particular, even expense were sacrificed to reach some scenic vista or to develop a particularly interesting point. All the natural beauty spots were fixed as control points in the location adjusted to include them. Although a highway would have a commercial value in connecting the coast country with the eastern areas, no consideration was given the commercial over scenic requirements. The one prevailing idea in the location and construction was to make this highway a great scenic boulevard, surpassing all other highways of the world. Samuel Lancaster, the highway's engineer, the, the, the man on the right there, wrote that there is but one Columbia River Gorge that God has put into this comparatively short space with so many beautiful waterfalls, canyons, cliffs, and mountain domes. People from all climes, he believed, will wonder at its great grandeur when once it is made accessible by this great highway. Lancaster saw the highway as an extremely worthwhile task, for if the road is completed according to plans, it will rival, if not surpass, anything to be found in the civilized world. It will be the king of roads. Oregon's Columbia River Highway is an outstanding example of modern highway development in 20th century America. Here's a close-up uh, showing uh, the location uh, essentially from Portland East to the Dalles. The reason why it's uh, an outstanding example of modern highway development is that it includes an adherence to, to set grade, grade and curve standards, the use of comprehensive drainage systems, dry and mortared masonry walls, reinforced concrete bridges, and an asphaltic concrete pavement, all on a rural mountain road. And what makes it even more special is this was really, it was done during the formative years of modern highway building in the United States. The road is also considered the single most important contribution to the fields of civil engineering and landscape architecture by Samuel C. Lancaster. 
It is an exemplar example of American landscape architecture, specifically as the first scenic highway in the United States. In setting design standards for the Columbia River Highway, Lancaster wore the hats of both engineer and landscape architect. He created an engineering achievement sympathetic to the natural landscape, and you'll see, this, see that in the slides that, that, that follow. And in doing so, made the Columbia River Gorge's idyllic natural setting accessible to tourists without unduly, unduly marring its beauty. Lancaster's Columbia River Highway was a combination of advanced engineering and landscape architectural elements that put in practice the concept of landscape engineering in modern highway design, and it embodied the National Park Service's lying lightly on the land philosophy, uh, one that was used, uh, wasn't really used for uh, another decade, a uh, full decade before St Stephen Mather adopted it uh, for, for construction of uh, the Going to the Sun Road and Glacier Park and later highways throughout the National Park System. The Columbia River Highway preceded that by at least 10 years. So what do we have here, the Ochsenstrasse? The story for the Columbia River Highway really starts maybe uh, about 1899. Uh, we have uh, two gentlemen who uh, had a lot of energy for this road, but came at it from different angles. The first was uh, Samuel Hill. Sam Hill was the son-in-law of, of James J. Hill, the railroad baron. He was a lawyer who worked for the company in Minneapolis and eventually came out west to manage some of Hill's western roads, some of the smaller railroads and other business interests out here. He was also a real proponent of good roads, I think in part because if you had good roads, you could get produce and other things to railroad sidings, and it, it helped, it helped the, the railroad industry. He became involved in the Washington State Good Roads Movement, uh, a charter member of that organization, the Washington State Good Roads Association, in 1899. The group is still around today as the Washington State Good Roads and Transportation Association. It's been around for over 100 years, promoting good roads and other good transportation entities. Hill was out here in 1899, out, out in Seattle, and, and, and became a charter member of this group and was a strong promoter for years. Um, he got plugged into the state of Washington's uh, good roads program and, and was, a, was a strong lobbyist with the legislature and with the governors and uh, uh, saw that there was a need for some type of a uh, a system of roads in the state of Washington. Uh, there weren't any, nothing comprehensive. Road building was, was primarily dominated by county governments and uh, uh, work details, nothing very sophisticated either in the way work was done or in the roads themselves. Uh, at the same time, the state, the federal government had a Office of Public Roads Inquiries, essentially a clearinghouse for, uh, for uh, this, the beginning of this whole movement. And one of their engineers out came out west, someone who'd who was successful in Tennessee, and that was Samuel Lancaster. Uh, what sets him apart from others was he was willing to try what was seen as kind of state-of-the-art engineering with, uh, with uh, road design, and also he had a real sensitivity for the landscape. Well, these two by chance met in, in Seattle about 1905, and, or in the Yakima actually, 1905, at a, at a Good Roads Association meeting, and they became close friends. Lancaster could do what Hill wanted, what Hill envisioned. Hill was the promoter, he wasn't an engineer, but Lancaster was the engineer. So it was great that these two got together. Um, Hill had some money and decided to make uh, an offer to Lancaster to stay out west, and not, not, not go continue touring uh, for the Office of Public Road Inquiries around the nation to promote good roads, but to stay here and work. And he even set him up as uh, chair of the highway engineering department at at University of Washington, a new, a new program that Hill created. So he had a lot of influence. Um, at the same time, uh, the first International Roads Congress uh, came up in Paris in 1908. Hill had money, Hill was willing to travel, and he brought with him Lancaster and a guy named uh, Reginald Thompson, who was the head of the Parks and Rec Depart Park Parks Department for the city of Seattle, and another engineer named Henry Bowlby. And they went to Paris. Uh, but they also had another mission, and that was to uh, look at roads in Europe. And one in particular was the Ochsenstrasse in Switzerland. They toured uh, along the Rhine, saw some of the masonry walls of Charlemagne, but were really taken by the Ochsenstrasse, which was a route that, this, that uh, uh, connected two uh, provinces in, in Switzerland along Lake Lucerne. Uh, much of it was uh, built on a ledge here. As you can see in this picture, uh, you have uh, masonry walls. And 
you have a tunnel. You can see both ends of this tunnel. We'll see another picture later on of that. Of that. This kind of looks like the Columbia River Highway in the gorge. Well, go figure. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the, the prototype in many ways for that highway. Well, Lancaster and Hill came back, and Hill, Hill continues to lobby the Washington legislature for some type of a trunk route system. In the meantime, uh, Lancaster and, uh, does some work for, for Thompson in Seattle. Seattle's getting ready for the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition of 1909. Really wants to beauty, uh, pr pr make the city look beautiful. And with a park plan by, the Olm by uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, or I guess John C. Olmsted, uh, uh, one of the components was the Lake Washington Boulevard. Uh, Lancaster was, uh, was the engineer chosen to uh, make this happen. And, and here is a nice, really nice section of it. Most of it's straight, but here's a good section with a nice, gentle, curving uh, uh, road uh, bringing you down from one elevation to another. Uh, you can see in the distance there on the left uh, a nice little bridge. And there are trees, young trees, trees planted here uh, to enhance the, the landscape. At the same time, Hill uh, had purchased about 7,000 acres out uh, east of Portland, about 100 miles on the Washington side of the Columbia River at what is today the present day site of Mary Hill. Mary Hill Museum, if you recall, uh, is, is, is the mansion that he eventually built there and became an art museum. Um, he, would develop, he wanted to develop a utopian uh, community there. He was a practicing Quaker and, and, and saw this as a great place to, uh, to uh, um, practice his, his, his religious beliefs. But the roads there were poor, if anything, and he saw it as an opportunity for uh, experimentation and road building and brought Lancaster out there to Mary Hill about 1911, and they started building roads. What you see here are kind of poor quality pictures, but the one on the left shows a road going down the canyon from oh, about Stonehenge uh, down to uh, the waterfront where there was a little railroad town that became, eventually became the town of Mary Hill. Um, and on the right, you see a, a curved section with uh, dry laid masonry walls and guard rocks, and you see Mount Hood in the distance. Uh, unfortunately, much of this section was blown out in the 1960s with a flood, but there's still remnants of it in, in, in the, in the, after they had a, a recent uh, range fire and burned, uh, which burned a lot of vegetation, uh, all this uh, kind of revealed itself again after many decades. And I was out there a few years ago, and it was great to see it a uh, cool time of the year without the rattlesnakes. This is a later drawing uh, that uh, shows the standard dry rubble masonry wall that was adopted for the Columbia River Highway. And you just notice that there, there are real similarities here. The guard rocks are a little different. They look more like teeth rather than big rocks plop down there. But the dry masonry walls are evidently very similar. And they take a cue from uh, what uh, maybe what Lancaster saw in, in, in Europe along the Rhine and then uh, and along the Ochsenstrasse and uh, uh, what he perfected there at Mary Hill. The other part of the Mary Hill Road, the two other components of the Mary Hill Roads that are very interesting is, is in the upper, upper section of the upper loops, which is still very much there today and has been restored a bit. You see a road that's trying to make a, a, about a thousand foot elevation change, uh, but the existing roads are very steep. Lancaster's idea was, uh, after much study, that uh, the, the, uh, the greatest grade that anybody could, would want to encounter would be about a 6% grade. This is because uh, it's hard for animals to pull loads and then eventually automobiles to, to have enough power. And also, the braking capacity of, of, of wagons and, and, and cars. If you go up, you have to come down. So he used a kind of a, a curvilinear road uh, concept to develop distance along the road to create what railroads did, in a sense, to maintain a general grade. And they chose a grade of about 5%. That's one component here. You also notice that this road has asphalt. Um, roads up. Roads through much of the 19th century, even before, were uh, or through the much of the 19th century, were, were macadam, water-bound macadam roads that consisted of, of various sizes of, uh, of rock that was uh, laid out and, and pounded down, rolled, and then watered and rolled. And then there was uh, layers of, of, of fine rock laid down eventually with the dust and the water bind, binding these roads together. Uh, Steel-tired vehicles did very well on those because they ended up grinding the the rock a bit and creating more dust and you'd have some rain and, and with luck uh, your road would stay together, it wouldn't come apart. Uh, with the advent of vehicles with rubber tires, you tend to have, uh, uh, you create some dust but the tires tend to bounce the dust away and the roads don't rejuvenate themselves. So there needed to be a solution. Uh, many people at this time were playing around with just oiling roads and it didn't seem to work very well, kind of like the 
uh, chocolate coating on an ice cream bar flakes off once in a while, or it melts, uh, or becomes very slick. Lancaster developed several experiments. He'll even brought it, and he'll even brought in some uh, tank cars from California with with oil, with asf with really gooey oil, asphaltum, asphaltic oil, one of the byproducts of of the petroleum industry. And they experimented, and, and it's much like making caramel corn, and then rolling it out. And you have the aggregate, which is the popcorn, essentially, and you heat it up, and then mix it up with this tar, and then roll it out quickly before it really cools. And they tried several recipes and found one that worked very well. It wasn't slick when it got wet, it didn't come apart, uh, and it, it held up. So all this is coming together around 1911, and Hill is pitching this to the Washington legislature. In part, he'd like to see a road along the gorge. Uh, it may be self-serving in a sense. Uh, he, he, at first, he wanted a, a road network, including a road going north-south from Seattle to Portland, and hoping that others would come together and go along through Oregon and California down to San Diego, which is now I-5, essentially. And another road, along with others, uh, one of the other ma major roads would go from essentially Vancouver to Spokane, much of it through the gorge, and then coming up through this upper loop, heading up to Goldendale, and then over to Spokane. Uh, he even was the chair of the Washington State Roads Advisory Committee at this time and was, 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 was a confidant of the governor and, and others. Well, politics changed, and the uh, uh, governor essentially cut off the funding. Hill ended up supporting his, his, his uh, opponent, who en ended up winning, Governor Lister, and then uh, Lister didn't come through either. So Hill was fed up with the state of Washington. This is about 1911. Uh, he walked across the, the, the Columbia to, to Portland. He'd owned one of the telephone companies in Portland for a few years and was plugged in there and could rally some support from Governor West and others and some of the local folks in Portland. Well, the upshot of all this was in the spring of 1913, Hill um, gathered up all the Oregon legislature on a special train to Mary Hill to show them his roads up there, his experimental roads. And we have some scrapbooks that Lancaster put together showing all this. The, the loops, the masonry walls, the grades, the asphalt. The legislature thought this was a pretty good idea. Came back to Salem and immediately created the Oregon State Highway Commission, 1913, and, and also marked out a, road, a, route of, uh, a system of trunk routes. The stumbling block, though, in those early years was that uh, counties still had the authority to build roads. It wasn't a state, state uh, endeavor. Uh, the state had a commission to try to create a framework and a strategy, be strategic here, on, and lay out a, a, a system of roads. Um, but the counties really the, were the ones that, 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 that had the money or, or could put up the money and had, had, to, had to buy into this. Uh, that did happen in Multnomah County. You have Rufus Holman, newly elected county commissioner. You have uh, some other influence and others on the commission. Um, uh, Henry Pittock, publisher of the Oregonian. Sam Jackson, publisher of the Oregon Journal. And uh, Simon Benson, uh, a lumberman who'd done very well. You have Benson House here on campus. You have the hot Benson Hotel in town. A lumberman who'd retired and decided to go into becoming a, a hotel manager, owner, and uh, involved in other things. Benson's son, Amos. Uh, John Yon, another lumberman who'd done well. They all were supporters of this. Well, in the, let's, let's, there were supporters of roads. And they were supporters of a road along the Oregon side of the Columbia River. Much like what Hill had envisioned for Washington. It would become part of a trunk route. It would go from Portland East. It had some economic value. Um, and it also took people out there to see the gorge. And as you can see here, this is a picture from, sh from uh, what is today Portland Women's Forum State Park uh, at what used to be called Chanticleer Inn. This is down at the bottom of that park where you get the beautiful view of Vista House where that first picture was taken, the color shot. This building is no longer there. It burnt in the tw in the 20s or 30s. Uh, well, this is about as far east as you could go on a road in the Columbia Gorge. Um, those on the Oregon Trail came down the river, floated down the river from the Dalles, or went over the Barlow Road. Uh, there were some rail railroads came through in the 1870s. Or, excuse me. Um, there were some there were some Portage railroads in the 1850s about where Bonneville Dam is. Uh, the legislature appropriated money in the 1870s for a wagon road from from essentially Troutdale to the Dalles. It uh, wasn't very, very passable, 20% grades. Of course, it wasn't paved with asphalt. Very tight curves, hairpin curves. Um, the railroad came through in 1883 and, and really took up all the good buildable, buildable land down by the river. 
because they need to have a, a grade that isn't, grades aren't very steep and in some ways built over the old road that was there from the 1870s. <clears throat> this is about as far east as you could go on a, on a highway or on, on any type of county road system uh, before you hit the gorge, and that, that was it. You end up, a, hill, and a hill ends up drumming up a lot of support for this concept of a road uh, to the point where the county commission, uh, here are some of the movers and shakers, Amos Benson uh, on the bottom right, Simon Benson on the top left, Sam Hill on the top right, uh, Lancaster again on the bottom left, and, uh, and John Yon in the center. And I could say there were many others. Um, they solidified this in the fall of 1913 with the idea that the county would, bond, would, would sell bonds to build the road. And the hope was that Hood River County and then Wasco County would come along line, come, come, come online with this, and also going west towards the coast, uh, uh, Washington County, Columbia County, Clatsop County uh, would all band together and we'd end up having a road that went from uh, Astoria to, to the Dalles and hopefully connect with other routes to the east and north. So immediately, uh, County Commission hires Sam Lancaster as its engineer. Um, the State Highway Department, or the State Highway Commission, has the authority at this point to do not much more except uh, design bridges. The county has to pay to have them constructed, but they would design them for free. The State Highway Department would. Here's a little quick wrap-up on Lancaster's uh, ideas for curves. I, I don't expect you to read all this, but. Uh, the diagram on the top left is showing uh, different, different grades, maximum grades, and how many horses it required, the horsepower it required for those. Um, you see curves, minimum, minimum radius for curves. Uh, Lancaster's field I believe, believe that uh, a 200-foot turning radius on a curve was, was about as tight as you really wanted to go and maintain a 5% grade, 5% or less. Um, you also see that he, he does, poke, he does uh, do a little bit of work on, on crowning and super elevation, and you see a bit of that on the road also. These are some of the, I, some of the constraints Lancaster imposed upon himself in the fall of 1913 when he, had, when he headed out with uh, crews of men to, uh, to cut through the brush and survey for a road east of uh, Crown Point, or east, east of, Port of Chanticleer Inn, uh, to the Multnomah Hood River County line out near Eagle Creek, out near, out near Bonneville Dam today. The second part of that, here, here we are kind of recapping the Mary Hill experiments. And this picture shows that, uh, that one of the biggest fears with roads was all the rain we get out here. We get, uh, there's nearly 100 inches of rain a year around Cascade Locks. It's less here, and of course it's much less east of Cascade Locks in the rain shadow near Hood River. But still, where it is rainy, you need one, the, 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 one of the goals was to get water, keep water off the roadway. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they have a crown. They are, um, Lancaster also designs gutters and uh, drainage systems, drainage tile, and you see quite a bit of this um, uh, east of Vista House down through the figure eight loops, uh, which is, like I said, one of the other components of his whole uh, uh, framework for, for road design. Interestingly enough, as, as we speak today, uh, ODOT, uh, or the Federal Highway Administration in Vancouver has completed a study of the gutters along the route uh, and has itemized, has, has inventoried the whole gutter system. And, and it's interesting that it's pretty much all there still. Much of it's covered with rock falling off the hillside or been filled over with traction sand and abandoned. And uh, it really is a component of the roadway that needs to be maintained, and that's something we're looking into right now. As I said earlier, uh, well, let me back up a bit and say that the, the surveying uh, was pretty much completed for the Oregon or for the for the Multnomah County portion of this road by late fall 1913, and uh, uh, the county sells bonds, raises raises the initial amount of money to, to start work, and uh, uh, John Yon comes to the front and or comes up and uh, uh, volunteers to be the roadmaster. Yon is someone who'd worked with gangs of guys, loggers out in the woods, and knew how to motivate men to work. And they were all men on these, on these, on these gangs. Um, and he did it very well. He did it for a dollar a year. And he was, he was really the motivating force, along with Simon Benson's son, Amos, who tagged along with him uh, on, on, on these uh, expeditions, really, out uh, east of uh, Chanticleer Inn. So construction was started 
in the fall of 13, really got going in the spring of 1914. Uh, but you have many streams to cross here, and you need bridges. We have probably a dozen really nice bridges on the Columbia River Highway east of Portland. They're all concrete, uh, except for, they're all reinforced concrete, concrete except for uh, the Sandy River Bridge at Stark Street and the Sandy River Bridge at, at Troutdale. And interestingly enough, those, really, those predate the highway by a couple of years, and uh, uh, they, they're both trusses, steel trusses. The predominant bridge, though, predominant bridge uh, type we have uh, on the highway are reinforced concrete. We have uh, several reinforced concrete deck girder bridges, which are pretty utilitarian in many ways, and it was a model that could be lengthened or shortened like a, like a pair of shoes to, to fit different locations. Uh, we have some, though, though, that are really monumental. And the designers of these bridges were two men uh, who uh, had come on board with the highway department about in 1913. Carl Billner and Louis Metzger. We don't know much about Billner. We do know that Metzger was a graduate of Cornell engineering program and, and, and later went on to the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads as a, as a designer. They both worked for Charles Purcell, who was brought in as the state bridge engineer. Purcell uh, later on uh, shines as the, as, the, as the engineer for the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge uh, in the 30s. But this is earlier in his career and uh, as far as we know, he, he, he didn't have a lot of hands-on with, with the bridges. It was pretty much left up to Billner and, and Metzger, and, and they indeed signed themselves as designers on the plans. This is an interesting little bridge here, the Laterell Creek Bridge. It uh, dates from 1914. It's, uh, what is it, an arch or a truss? Well, it's really a, 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 an arched truss. It's, it's a truss bridge that spans uh, a pretty, pretty wide uh, uh, crossing, uh, three spans, very lightly constructed. Uh, that's why it's, it's, it's trusses rather than solid walls. Uh, it has the delicate, uh, delicate uh, spindles uh, on the railing. Um, it's all reinforced concrete. Uh, all the components were mixed on site. And it was all poured by hand with, with wheelbarrows. It's amazing. No plywood, all tongue and groove uh, uh, forms. Uh, it's, it's, it's really simply amazing that, that it, w it could be carried out. About uh, 10 years ago, ODOT employed the Park Service's Historic American Engineering Record to uh, create some interpretive and measured drawings of the highway, looking at landscapes, looking at structures uh, on the road like the bridges and the tunnels, and also the roadway itself. And you saw a couple of the earlier drawings showing the whole, trying to, to uh, explain the, uh, the concepts of grade and curvature and, and drainage and all that. Here's a good one that's a kind of a cutaway of, of the Laterell Creek Bridge. It really is a light structure. And what you, what's interesting is this, is this is the early period for using reinforcing bar in concrete bridges. Uh, I think we have some of the first, concrete, first reinforced concrete bridge in this country was in 1886. And this is uh, 1914. Earlier bridges, uh, often designers threw in whatever they could find uh, uh, in terms of, of reinforcing steel. I don't know, the, 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 the concepts of what reinforcing steel did uh, were, 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 were still developing. But we have here is uh, a bridge with square section ribbed reinforcing bar, much like what we use today. We use round reinforcing bar, cylindrical reinforcing bar, but it's very similar. Another bridge that Bilner, or that, that, that Bilner designed was the Shepherdsdale Arch, Shepherdsdale Bridge. This is just a bit east of uh, Laterell. Laterell is a couple miles east of uh, Vista House. Shepherdsdale is a few miles east of there. This is a great setting for an arch. You have a couple of rock outcroppings. Uh, arch, bridge likes to, arch bridges work well in, the, in these locations where you can contain the, uh, the thrust of the arch in the natural outcroppings. And this is a very traditional looking arch bridge, one you might see done in masonry in other parts of the world. Here it is done in concrete. Delightful little structure. Uh, classical design elements, semicircular Roman arches in the spandrel walls, uh, uh, astragals. Uh, here again we have the, the, the picketed, uh, the, the spindled railing with a concrete cap. Here's one of the lesser bridges, really, in some ways. It's a little reinforced concrete deck arch at, at Horsetail Falls. We have one very similar to this at Oneonta. It's bypassed now. The Oneonta Bridge is bypassed in the 40s when uh, uh, the highway department closed the Oneonta Tunnel and, 
and move the railroad, and today you drive right by it and not even realize it's there. They, they rerouted the route, road around uh, the bluff there. These little bridges are, are, we'll talk a bit more about these later on, but, but uh, we have some of the same design elements that you see in, in some of the reinforced, con in some of the masonry walls, and that is the, the arched form there in the railings, uh, very light, very delicate. Uh, but, but here again, a reinforced concrete bridge. Another one that, uh, that is, is, is a landmark structure is the Eagle Creek Bridge. This is about 40 miles east of Portland uh, at, the, at, at Eagle Creek, uh, just uh, upriver up from Bonneville Dam. Looks like a masonry bridge. It isn't. Looks are deceiving. It's only skin deep. This is a uh, very cutting edge reinforced concrete deck arch with, uh, with a masonry veneer. The construction on the highway in uh, Multnomah County was completed about 1915, 19, right about pretty much 1916. It was open for travel, <coughs> uh, but you couldn't get past, drivers couldn't get past uh, uh, Eagle Creek. Couldn't, couldn't go no further than the, could go no farther than the county line. By 1916, the federal aid, first federal aid road act is passed. It provides some money for, for for state governments, uh, later federal aid road acts provide more money, and uh, uh, we see a bit of a change in the way this road was constructed. First, like I said, it first started out as a county highway or county road. Uh, you, uh, federal participation comes into play uh, for a bit with Hood River County and, and more so with Wasco County as as uh, as uh, the federal government takes a greater role in, in road building. The third engineer who designed bridges on the highway was Condi B. McCullough. McCullough came to Oregon in 1916 and then became the state bridge engineer in 1919. He's best known for the major bridges on the Oregon Coast Highway, uh, the ones you see at Newport, uh, Depot Bay, Rocky Creek, Cape Creek, uh, Coos Bay, Gold Beach. Most of them have an arch component, and that was the form that he preferred, and it's the form he's noted for. Here's one of his bridges on the, on the uh, Columbia River Highway. This is, oh, about uh, five miles east of Mosier, between Mosier and Rowena. This is Dry Creek Canyon. He has another bridge similar to this at Mosier. You don't see the Mosier one because you drive right across it and never see a profile. But this one you do. It's a bit different in, for, different in style from the ones that Bilner and Metzger, Metzger designed. Uh, McCullough's structures, at least in his early period in the 20s, in, in the late teens, early 20s, have this signature uh, semi-segmental uh, arched railing openings. Uh, the proportions of his structures uh, are, 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 are different from those that you see from, say, Shepherd's Dell Bridge. It's, it's, and he, he loads them up with architectural elements, the elbow brackets, uh, the square spandrel columns with the, with the collars. Uh, here again, we have some Roman arched uh, elements coming into play. Later on he becomes a real fan of Gothic arches and then, and then uh, Art Deco. Here's a recap of some of the bridges we have on the Columbia River Highway. Well, there on the left there are, are all the arch spans, the major arch spans. Uh, then we have some girder spans on the right. I think the most interesting is the Bridal Veil Falls Bridge because the railings themselves are the bridge girders. The deck is pretty much just a slab suspended bet between the two railings. So the railings are, the, are providing the structural support here, holding the bridge up. Uh, here they've got Oneonta. And then we have a couple others that are pretty run of the mill, but uh, uh, there again, there's the Tanner Creek and Herman Creek. But there again, there's still reinforced concrete structures in the, in the early years of, 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 of that technology. Here we are with the slab spans again. Another component of this road was its tunnels. Uh, this is a tunnel, believe it or not. It's the Bishop's Cap. We call Bishop's Cap. It's a half tunnel. You can see a half. You can, one can see a carved, carved form there to the left as the road goes around the outcropping. Uh, it's called Bishop's Cap because it looks like a bishop's miter, bishop's hat. Uh, only on a tunnel was one I mentioned. Um, only t on a tunnel is very short uh, and was closed in 1948 and bypassed. Uh, the road went. The road today goes around it. Um, 
I think the, the, my feeling is that the inspiration for the tunnels on this, on this road, though, the, 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 the three major tunnels, uh, was the Ochsenstrasse. Uh, here it is again in, in, in uh, Switzerland. Here's Mitchell Point Tunnel. Mitchell Point Tunnel is just about, uh, let's see, 58 miles from Portland uh, to this side of Hood River. Uh, a man named John Arthur Elliott, the man I quoted from earlier, uh, worked with Lancaster as a graduate student at the University of Washington. and. Wouldn't you know it, he ends up showing up uh, in Oregon and, and, and uh, designs this tunnel. Uh, he took the cue from Lancaster. He didn't go to Europe, but he took the cue from Lancaster that, that something like this would be nice. Indeed, he developed, uh, he, he, he developed the plans for this uh, tunnel with many windows. It has five windows rather than three, which the Oxenstrasse had. The tunnel is no longer there. We'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, the Moser Twin Tunnels were constructed in 1919 under the uh, leadership of, of Condi McCullough, the state bridge engineer. We don't know who actually designed them. We have a think, I, have, I have an inkling it was someone named, uh, Roy, it may have been Roy Klein, but I'm not sure. Uh, these are the Moser Twin Tunnels in 1919. I don't know if any of you have been up there today, but they look quite different. Uh, these tunnels originally were not lined. They were uh, carved out uh, by uh, A.D. Kern and Company, who did most, most of the work on the highway east of Hood River. Kern was a local contractor here in Portland, and you can find his name stamped in the, a lot of the concrete sidewalks around here if you look, look closely. Um, they look cave-like in a way. That was the intent. Uh, some of the, this fits in with the whole lying lightly on the land concept, uh, but it was very impractical because the rock in this part, part of the gorge is, is kind of rotten, and it tends to drop and was falling on people. So very early on, by 1921, uh, uh, the tunnels were lined. Uh, masonry, re, uh, masonry portals were installed on, on, on both tunnels. There's a short tunnel and a long tunnel. And here we are seeing one of the portals. There's another portal, the other end of that short tunnel. Uh, and here we are looking at the uh, west portal of the east tunnel, and then the east portal of the east tunnel. <coughs> these, the linings on these tunnels consisted of uh, Port Orford cedar, uh, sets, essentially big posts, and then lagging, which was the wood put up around behind the, to create the canopy, and then a lot of cordwood was thrown in behind the canopy just to kind of cushion the fall of rocks so they wouldn't punch through the lining. Scenic inspiration, as I said at the beginning, was, was, was one of the components that, that uh, Lancaster saw here in the gorge. Really, he was trying to create a road that met high engineering standards and, and, and connected the dots, so to speak, going from one uh, uh, scenic vista to the next, trying to, to take the road along all the waterfalls between uh, uh, where today is Vista House to uh, uh, Warrendale, and uh, do, do it in such a way that it was a pleasing drive. Th early on, you realize that the, the only folks who had automobiles to drive this road had to be fairly well off, but I think the long term, the vision here was that, that, that in the short term, it was a way of getting people out in the gorge who could do it. In the long term, though, uh, it was a road that, that ha had high engineering standards, and the hope was that it would be around for a while. Here we have a few of the places, Lateral Falls, uh, 1915, there it is in, in 2004. really hasn't changed much. This is one of those places to, 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 that, that, that people were directed to, to, to go and to stop and to, to get inspiration from uh, the, the, the beauty all around them. Here's Joaquina Falls. Uh, this is just a bit west of Multnomah Falls. Uh, it hasn't changed much. Here at Multnomah Falls, the area has been developed a bit more, in part to handle the two million visitors that, 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 that stop there every year. But the bridge, little bridges there, the little bridge that Simon Benson paid for uh, in 1914. Uh, we do have an account from the man who constructed it, and it was quite a story with mules and <laughs> taking supplies up to the location with mules, and then, of course, mixing the concrete on site and, and pouring it by hand. Uh, here's Shepherd's Dell. What's interesting here is that the road includes several little trails. We have a design landscape that was developed that Lancaster created. The idea was that once you take folks out in the gorge, you have to be able to get to lead them to some of these uh, locations to, to, in a friendly way. Here again, we have, we have the uh, stone uh, uh, guard walls made out of local basalt, mortared walls with a concrete cap. That's the original wall, the original walkway. It hasn't changed since 1914. Here's a good picture of the road in the fall, something might, much like what you would see today, moss on the tops of the, of the, of the guard walls, uh, uh, very striking. Here's the county line overlook east of Hood River, 
Uh, as you can see, the landscape's quite different because you're in rain, it's in a rain shadow, and, uh, uh, but still, again, we have uh, the, the masonry guard walls that provide the continuity and, and carry the road along, the, along the, uh, the ledge. This is a more modern picture, just showing, showing how folks are seeing it today. This is a, a, a car rally a few years ago. Of course, we have, uh, this is probably the last of the uh, uh, public uh, facilities out in the gorge, that, that, the facilities that catered to the motoring public. There were other inns and places where one could get uh, country dinners, salmon, uh, venison, other things. Mullimo Falls is, is, is one of the earliest and, and is, is the one we all think about. It's been there since 1925, uh, and it's uh, served the public since in, in much the way it did then. The highway, bec the, there's, a, there's a long period from 1922 to 1980 where this highway, highway changes uh, and, and not in the best way. Here's a picture from 1920 showing the viaduct coming into the Mitchell Point Tunnel. It's great. Cars are coming out. There's a photographer there. I don't know where the guy took the picture from, but uh, it's amazing. Well, in a short 20 years, uh, this highway ends up looking like this. Uh, it became very popular. We have two things working in against it, though. One is uh, automobiles become more plentiful with the Model T and, and others that are mass-produced and are, are, are not very expensive. The other thing is that... Uh, Technology advances with automobiles. They become faster, bigger, have better suspensions, better brakes, and uh, all this really kind of does in the highway. Uh, natural problems with uh, rock fall at, Mo at the Moser Twin Tunnels. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not working well in the highway's favor. Uh, as you can see, the little, rock, the little walkway over to the left that was designed for people to stop in the tunnel and get out and take a look uh, became very impractical. Here's a picture from 1942 showing a semi-truck going through there, and he lost his load in the Mosher Twin Tunnels, those tunnels that look very natural-like that we saw earlier. Here they are. You can see the lining in there. Something happened. that The truck went sideways, maybe by sideswipe a car or another truck and lost his load of pipe. Well, as you can see, this highway was, was, was really a, a, a thing of the past by 1942, and it's, it's ironic when one considers that uh, not even 30 years before it was seen as <laughs> first scenic highway, a model of engineering, one of the most modern of roads. Ten years before that, in, the, in 1933, when uh, designers were, w w when the federal government was creating, w w was getting ready to construct Bonneville Dam, uh, there was a need to relocate a portion of the highway just, just behind the dam. Uh, the water, the water created, the water, the lake behind the dam uh, was projected to flood the railroad. The railroad needed to be reloc relocated. That meant relocating a portion of the road. Uh, in the top right, you can see uh, the railroad tunnel, the new railroad tunnel at the time, and, uh, and, and a tunnel above that to the right. And that tunnel is Tooth Rock Tunnel, which you see on Interstate 84 today. Uh, it's interesting, people don't realize this, that, that essentially the, the, the two eastbound lanes of Interstate 84 from, from, from Bonneville Dam through Tooth Rock Tunnel and on to Cascade Locks date from 1937. It was the first relocation of the Columbia River Highway, and really it was the first section of roadway in the state of Oregon that was built with the idea of, of a more modern expressway, I think. That, that, that's my thesis on this. Uh, this bridge is still there today, but it's much lower. The, 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 the top has been removed. It's been completely reworked. But this was a bridge con constructed just east of that tunnel, and the picture is taken from the original Columbia River Highway, and, the, and it's showing the eastbound lanes of, of, of what is I-84 today. And here, they, here we go, continuing on east towards Cascade Locks. Quite different road, uh, in part because technology had changed. You have uh, road graders like this. This is 1936, 37. Road graders, big dump trucks, uh, and the ability to make cuts like this. Uh, that was unheard of uh, in 1915. You see a bit of that. Uh, you see a bit of ro earth moving and, and, and heavy earth moving. Uh, east of Hood River, and uh, the, uh, the reason I think is that uh, there was more money uh, and trucks were available from the federal government after World War II, and just technology is changing so much. You're, you have the ability to get steam shovels up there and, and, and do some heavy earth moving, but, but still, uh, it doesn't really take off until the 30s, and this is a great example. At the same time, we still have traffic on other portions of the Columbia River Highway. Here's uh, Vista House, about 19, I figure this is about 1938. 
It still has its original tile roof. Um, here we have a car at Bishop's Cap. That's about a 41 Plymouth, so it's their Dodge. So this probably was taken right around World War II. What eventually happens is that plans are made to kind of connect to connect up that portion of New Road at Bonneville with a, a, an entirely new route from Portland, uh, a water level route, using the technology of the time, which included heavier equipment and also the ability to uh, to take river dredgings that the Corps of Engineers was uh, was gathering up in the river after construction of Bonneville Dam, dumping those along the Wash Oregon side of the river and creating some buildable land. A combination of this leads to a new water level route essentially from Troutdale to the Dalles. And <clears throat> some of the early work uh, began about 1939, uh, just east of Troutdale. The war, World War II, though, cut off all work on the highway. And then right after World War II in 1946, we see uh, the first of the major structures, uh, the Bridal Veil Interchange, completed in 1946. Um, the highway department widened that in 1964 when the second two lanes of this highway came through. It was the vision, though, in the 30s that this would eventually be a four-lane expressway through the gorge. So essentially what you're driving on today, what, what one drives on when, when you're on Interstate 84 in, in the gorge, is, uh, is, is a road that was envisioned in the 30s. Uh, nearly 20 years before the Interstate Highway Act. Here's the two-lane section of, of, of the original low water level version of the Columbia River Highway near Rooster Rock. Uh, Vista House is up on the hill on, on, the, on the right there. Rooster Rock is in the center. Here we are near, near Mitchell Point, um, just west of Mitchell Point near, near Wigan Trail. Well, I guess all things come to, good things come to an end, and Mitchell Point Tunnel, which was seen as, as, as beautiful and, and, and in some ways uh, 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 cutting-edge engineering, was so narrow uh, and was uh, going to be bypassed that the simplest thing to do with it was to mothball it, to, to fill it in. So in 1954, that's what happens. The picture we saw here from 1920 uh, goes to this picture in 1940, that picture in 1954. Quite The idea was that this tunnel, once it was bypassed in 1953, when the, when the water level route, at least the first two lanes, were completed to the Dalles, it was unnecessary to, to keep it open. It was a, it was a liability. Uh, the highway department believed the best thing to do was to fill it in. And uh, that's what happened. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, there was not enough roadway there to complete the second, or enough, enough buildable land to complete the second two lanes of the freeway in, 19, in, in, the, in the late 50s, early 60s. And the simplest thing to do was to cut back the, the, the cliff face, uh, which included uh, removing Mitchell Point Tunnel. Uh, this was from an exhibit we had at uh, the World Forestry Center. And uh, uh, their tag was completed in 1915 and blown to hell in 1966. And it was literally lifted off the, the face of, of the rock outcropping. Here we are uh, showing construction in that area. This isn't at the same location, but because this gives you the feel, one the feel of uh, uh, what the Interstate 84, Interstate what be, was originally Interstate 80 North, looked like uh, in the late 1950s. This is just a bit bit east of of, of Mitchell Point, actually. So to recap, by uh, by, the, by about 1971, about 1970, when the Eagle Creek Viaduct was completed. Uh, one sees a freeway uh, going the length of the gorge from Portland to the Dalles. And there's a, here and there you see a couple loop sections of the Columbia River, old Columbia River Highway, one from Troutdale to uh, Bono, one from Troutdale to Dodson, and another one from, from uh, Moser to uh, the Dalles. Uh, two things happened, I think, to, mo to spark people's interest in the highway. And one was uh, removal of the Mitchell Point Tunnel. That was seen as a real work of art. The other one was r removal of the Hood River Bridge. One bridge we didn't talk about earlier, but this was a bridge that spanned the Hood River at the east end of downtown Hood River. Um, it was removed in 1980, and that sparked a real cry from people. Uh, it wasn't unlike uh, the loss of the Penn Station in New York City to motivate a historic preservation movement to try to save this road. So what's happened since then? Um, we have several things. One is that uh, 
uh, uh, several folks got together to uh, push to have the Columbia River Highway nominated to the National Register, and that happened in 1983 for the reasons I outlined earlier. Uh, its sensitivity to the landscape and its modern roadway engineering at the time. In 1983, also, the Oregon Transportation Commission uh, and, and ODOT were dedicated to the goal of preserving and restoring the scenic and unique characteristics of this highway. This was an OTC policy that was presented in 1983. In 1986, the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area Act was, was signed, <coughs> Ronald Reagan signed that in 1986. And one of the goals was to preserve and restore the continuity and historic integrity of the remaining segments of the old Columbia River Highway for public use. And finally, in 1987, the Oregon legislature uh, unanimous, at least the Senate unanimously uh, um, approved a resolution or a, a bill uh, that declares that it is public policy of the state of Oregon to preserve and restore the continuity and historic integrity of the remaining segments of the highway. What you see all of a sudden is a flurry of projects uh, funded with various, various money sources, including enhancement dollars and, and, and some earmarks uh, through the generosity of Mark Hatfield, uh, Oregon senator, uh, senior senator at the time. One of the first is replacing a menagerie of guardrail. Uh, here you can see some pretty rough stuff uh, that came up through the years with some steel-backed wooden guardrail. This is much like the original guardrail that was constructed on the highway in about 1920. Although to meet today's crash standards, uh, ODOT developed a rail with larger timber members and galvanized steel plate backing and large, and large uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, Texas Transportation Institute crashed it and crash tested it in the early 1990s and, and uh, certified it f uh, for a 50 mile hour crash. Masonry guard walls were falling down everywhere and We've had several projects that have included a repair of these walls. So they're, they're, they're slip form grout lock walls. And here we're seeing the grout being put in and, uh, and the basalt pieces uh, applied. Another part of this uh, project was to, to recast many of the spindles on these bridges. They'd really fallen into disrepair, both on the, on the drivable portions of the road and, and sections that had been abandoned. Here, here is another picture of these spindles cast recast, precast, and, play, and put in place. This is an old picture of the same bridge, the Moffat Creek Arts, but it, it, it shows you what it looked like and it's, when it opened, and, and uh, it, it, it once again looks that way. Here's a little treasure of a dry laid wall that's hidden behind a bin wall on Interstate 84. Uh, it's there, but nobody ever sees it. Uh, we had many abandoned sections of roadway, uh, mainly between uh, Cascade Locks and Hood River, and a long section between Hood River and Mosier. Let me back up a bit, though, and say that there was there is one section near Bonneville Dam there uh, between Tanner Creek and Eagle Creek. It was the first uh, major segment of the of, of the uh, of abandoned roadway that, that ODOT and partner agencies, the Forest Service and uh, uh, Oregon Parks and Rec Department, uh, rehabilitated for bike pedestrian use. And there it is in '87. There it is in 1997. Quite different. Our biggest project to date really was uh, reopening the Hood River to Moser section, about six and a half miles of roadway abandoned in 1953. Uh, one portion of that was, uh, was, was mothballing the Moser Twin Tunnels, much like the Mitchell Point Tunnel. Uh, fortunately, these tunnels were never demolished, and uh, nature didn't uh, collapse them. Uh, the big project here was to, to remove all the rubble and with shotcrete and rock bolts in, inside the tunnels, uh, they could be stabilized and, and, accept and, and, and safe for uh, public use. Uh, one additional component, though, was that uh, we constructed a 700-foot rock catch structure uh, west of the tunnels because the area, the, the rock formations west of the tunnels are so unstable that, uh, that uh, it wasn't prudent to uh, lead folks into that area unprotected. But here we, sh here we see a, a restored tunnel, rehabilitated tunnel. Uh, high, ODOT was, was lucky enough to find some uh, timbers that were being taken out of uh, Elk Creek Tunnel in southern Oregon. The tunnel is being relined with concrete. And we were able to remill these timbers to the proper dimension for relocation here. And Port Orford Cedar is unavailable otherwise. Uh, you'd have to go outside of the country to find it. So we were able to do that and restore it accurately with the, with the original materials. This uh, portal on the east end is, has since been mudded over to cover up the gunshots. 
and restored a bit, so it's, it looks a bit better than this picture. But that gives you an idea of what, what, what those tunnels look like today. Another part was, was installing original style guard fences, restoring uh, guard walls, and uh, then finally creating a visitor center. When, you, when, you, when one creates a, a recreation resource like this, uh, one component is to, 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 to be able to, to ha have a f create a friendly experience for the visitor. In some ways, not unlike what Lancaster envisioned when he, when he created the trails to, to get people down to the waterfalls uh, between uh, Troutdale and, and Multnomah Falls and, and, and Oneonta and Horsetail Falls, all, all, all the falls between Troutdale and, and uh, Dodson and Warrendale. Here's a, visitor, here's a visitor center just up the hill, up the Hood River loops from uh, uh, Hood River. Uh, it, it has parking, uh, interpreta interpretive displays, restrooms. Uh, it's, it's a rehabilitated quarry that, uh, with a real scar on the landscape. Uh, now it's, 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 a, it's formalized with a parking lot. There's native vegetation been reintroduced into the area. Barracks Penstemon and some other endemic plants to the gorge, and it provides a, a great uh, staging area for folks who wish to jog or, or hike or, or bike or, or rollerblade up to the Mosier Twin Tunnels about three miles away. Another component was uh, we've d another another s small project was uh, was rehabilitating a few of these small bridges. Uh, over the years, uh, s s cracks have appeared on some of the girders, and the solution was to use a modern technology of fiber reinforced polymer wrap. And it's fiber reinforced polymer that's applied to on three sides of these girders, essentially creating a continuous stirrup, and then it's been colored a bit, uh, it's grayed a bit, and and the hope is that the the uh, that uh, uh, nature will darken this down a bit more. The strategy here, though, is to try to save the bridge with the, as much original fabric as possible without, uh, without uh, adversely affecting it. And indeed, I think this has been successful. OSU has put monitors on the bridge to determine whether uh, it, 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 it has the load capacity that, that, that uh, they hope for, and it's passed. The final project here I wanted to mention was that uh, we've created, that ODOT and partner agencies have created an interpretive uh, program along the highway with over 30 interpretive signs telling the story of the highway and its surroundings, the waterfalls, the geology. This is a great picture showing uh, one of the other roadhouses at Laterell Falls that, that operated from uh, the teens through about 19, late 50s. Uh, many of these closed up when the freeway came through, but, there, but this was one, and this was one of the last. Uh, Falls Villa. As I said at the at the beginning, the highway is significant nationally. Uh, in, ni in 2000, the Columbia River Highway became a National Historic Landmark. Of the 71,000 properties in the National Register, only about 3% are so significant at the national level uh, that they are designated National Historic Landmarks. And the Columbia River Highway is one of those, one of the, the, the very few, the 3,000 properties nationwide. It possesses national significance in commemorating the history of the United States of America. All this work on the highways received many accolades. The most recent one was the National, National Trust uh, Honor Award for restoring the Columbia River Highway, and, and this award was shared by ODOT and several other agencies that partnered uh, to restore and rehabilitate both the drivable portions of the highway and uh, the state trail segments. The highway was also featured at a recent historic roads conference in Portland last April um, it's seen it, the road and the work that ODOT and other agencies have done on this road are seen as, 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 a, as a leader in, 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 in a movement to restore and rehabilitate historic roads nationwide and, and maybe worldwide. Just to end, here's a few, here are a few fun photos. Uh, we had a celebration in 2000 when, when ODOT reopened the Mosier Twin Tunnels. We had a car rally of 80 antique cars from 1909 to 1949. Here's the group at Vista House. Uh, it was great. It was great fun. Here's a, I think about a 1932 Franklin. Uh, that's probably how it was like to drive down this road in maybe 19 you know, years ago, decades ago. Sometimes folks had problems, and uh, they had a, a, a good, good Samaritan out there uh, fixing it. And that's really all I have to say, except this is a, is a great program that uh, we hope continues on for uh, several decades. Any quick questions? Yeah. Um, looking into the future, what would be another uh, 
other ways that the road can be enhanced and restored. We have uh, the biggest uh, the biggest roadblock for us for, uh, for ODOT and partners is is completing is creating a link from Portland all the way to the Dalles, where someone could get on a bicycle and ride the drivable sections from Portland to Dodson, uh, get on a, rec uh, a a trail section from Dodson to Cascade Locks or from Dodson all the way to Hood River. And then uh, and on through the tunnels, and, and then continue, uh, which would also be a trail section, and then get back on the drivable section from Moser to the Dalles. We've been poking away at that, and have some major portions completed uh, from Bonneville Dam to, uh, to Cascade Locks, from Hood River to Moser. But the biggest stumbling block is between Cascade Locks and Hood River. Much of the original highway was obliterated in that section. And you know, when I was researching this road, I thought, God, you know, they preserve the two ends, and they they sacrifice the middle. And they got rid of the middle. They just got rid of it. Well, they sacrificed it, and they sacrificed it with some good intentions. They preserved the views one would get from that, from the historic highway, as much like they preserved the views on the portions that they where they where they where they kept the old highway. Um, so they did get rid of it. But our hope is that we can do some trail building along the existing I-84 corridor, and provide a link so that folks can also see those on on bicycles and have some time to stop, and they're not on the shoulder of the freeway, and. Uh, uh, that's a long term. Uh, the other thing is, though, more more short term in a way, is that we're gearing up for the 100th anniversary of this highway. It was started in 1913, initially completed in 16. Uh, it was completely paved with asphalt and, and completed all the way out to uh, the Dalles by 1922. So if we look at 1913 as our benchmark, as our start, 2013 isn't very far away. And uh, we're gearing up for that in 2016 for sure. So. Uh, uh, we hope to have many other projects completed by then, and, and I'm, I'm sure other projects will continue on after that. Mm -hmm. yeah, is the uh, Vista House part of the, oh, part of the restoration of the Vista House, that part of uh, ODOT? That's a... Uh, any funding from the government for any of the highway restoration? Um, Vista House is a project. Uh, the Oregon Parks and Rec Recreation Department is the lead agency on the Vista House restoration, mm -hmm. um, but the, the, and ODOT is a partner definitely on that. The Federal Highway Administration, uh, the Western Federal Lands in Vancouver, is, is another partner. And the, 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 the color of money on that project is, is mixed. There's, there's money from many, 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 many pots, uh, uh, federal dollars, local fundraising dollars, uh, all, uh, direct federal dollars. We have, a, we have a real interest in that, 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 that property. It's on the highway. It was constructed because of the highway. That's one resource I didn't talk anything about really today. And it's one that you could spend a whole day talking about. Uh, it's a great place. It's still with us, and it's been lovingly restored, and uh, and that's that's a real that's something we can really commend Oregon Parks Recre and Recreation Department for. It's a it's a real asset along with Multnomah Falls Lodge, and uh, uh, well, those are probably the two that stand out to me. Uh, it's 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 an important part of this highway. Mm -hmm. Is there a date on when you think that? They're getting close. I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. It's uh, it's pretty much wrapped up, but I'm not sure when they'll be when, when their grand reopening will be. Hmm? Yes, I noticed a lot of cross sections of the various bridges on uh, some of the slides you showed. I was hmm. just wondering, was there a standard like deck width and roadway surface width for the like, highway? This highway was originally about uh, had a 24 foot road width, but that included everything. It had about 18 feet of roadway. Of paved roadway and then three-foot shoulders. Uh, what we what we figure uh, our, our our best 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 guess here is that sometime during the 30s, uh, the state took over ownership and maintenance of the road. It took that long, but eventually the state legally took took over ownership and maintenance. And I believe that uh, what the, one of the first steps was to to uh, pave the shoulders. So what 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 one ends up with is a roadway that's probably about 11 foot lanes. Your cent the, 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 the nine foot lanes plus a little bit on each side, uh, where, where one really sees a pinch point are, is though is uh, a few of the structures, especially around Multnomah Falls. Uh, the two viaducts there have very narrow, very narrow decks. They're the narrowest of any of them, and, and it's not because they purposely made them narrower. Because other decks are a little wider, uh, but the railroad is right there, and, and the highway had to. to, to the, 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 some adjustments were made to uh, avoid uh, crowding the railroad right away. So you have, so there, it's <laughs> the deck is about. Oh, Maybe 20 feet curb to curb, no shy distance. So, hmm? okay. 
Okay. Just want to, you know, I thought the, you know, the historical background, especially the you know, early examples, very interesting. Um, you notice you sort of skipped over the National Park Service survey in 1981 that was sort of the first organized preservation effort and really was one of the things that mobilized the preservation community and got ODOT to actually think about the highway again. That was an important survey, and some of the members of that survey are still with us. Diana Ross, for example, is with the Forest Service, and uh, she's still a active uh, player in this highway's restoration. I, I, I didn't intentionally skip that. I just did. Um, I'm sorry about that. There were others. Uh, Lou MacArthur. Uh, there was an early ad hoc committee of people. Today we have an uh, advisory committee composed mostly of citizens. Oregon is a big proponent of citizen advisory committees. And we have one that has six citizens, two from each county, one each appointed by the governor, one by the county commission, and then a representative from state parks, the Historic Preservation Office, Tourism Commission, and ODOT. And they advise ODOT and, and state parks on policy decisions on the highway. And they've been a real asset to us. And, and many folks like Lou MacArthur and Ken Jernstead, who was the author of that first that Senate bill to, to, to recognize the road, and, and others have, have, have really worked to, to, to uh, drum up support for this, this resource that we don't want to lose. It's an unusual historic resource. It's linear. It's not a house or a building downtown. It's 55 miles along a 75-mile corridor. And uh, it's the first, what's interesting is, is the first highway in the country to be landmarked. Okay. Well, on that, if you take note, before we thank our speaker, I want to mention that uh, next week, Aaron Jane from the City of Portland Bureau of Planning and Bob Hastings from TriMed will be here discussing urban design concepts for the transit mall that will be right outside the room a few years from now. And uh, so I think that will be a very interesting <laughs> and uh, so I'd encourage everyone to join us again next week. And so let's thank uh, Dr. Hadlow for his great presentation.